Um, I thought I'd spend a little time this evening reading from my book and a little time talking to you about why I wrote it. And just as a warning, when I'm done, I'm going to ask you to do something. And then I'll be happy to take some questions and we'll have a conversation. The book is basically written in two parts. The first part is about going to five wars in 10 years. And the second part's about what that does to you. Um, so let me start sort of at the beginning of my career. I joined the Army in 1983 as a private. I was a Fort Observer in a National Guard unit. And a couple of years later, I was commissioned into the regular Army into Armor Branch, served in the 11th Cavalry Regiment. I left Armor Branch under the Force Realignment Program. Some of you may have heard of that. Became a military intelligence officer, went to Korea to be a Cavalry Squadron S2 in the 2nd Infantry Division. While I was there, I was recruited into a special access program and sent off to training with what is obliquely called OGA, the Other Government Agency. And I spent four years in that world, including a company command. In 1994, I left the regular Army and joined the State Department as a Foreign Service Officer. Contrary to what Dr. Kissinger may think, the Foreign Service does not consist of, and I quote, a collection of striped pants fuddy-duddies, excessively internationalist in outlook, soft in the defense of the national interest, and a contributory cause of our difficulties abroad. Nonetheless, I stayed in the Army Reserve just in case. <laughs> I served as a political officer at State and began what I think was a somewhat unique career, bouncing back and forth between State and defense over the next 15 years. My first State Department posting was in Central Africa, where I took part in a non-combatant ev evacuation under fire in the Central African Republic, reported on the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide, and was dropped into the middle of what some Africans think of as the Banyamulenge War, a particularly nasty bit of fighting in eastern Zaire that left somewhere in the neighborhood of 350,000 dead. I have to give you a number like that because we still haven't found all the bodies or all the mass graves. Most of those dead simply disappeared, swallowed up into the relentless depths of the African forest between Rwanda and the center of the continent at what V.S. Naipaul referred to as simply a bend in the river, a town called Kisangani. <coughs> so my job during the Banya Malinge War was to determine what really was happening in the center of the continent and report that to Washington, and also quite incredibly, to find half a million people that had been driven out of refugee camps along the shores of Lake Kivu. When we finally found them, through a process I won't describe here because to shorten the tale is to do it injustice, it was too late. The US task force had already left. Not long afterward, I left Central Africa and was sent to Montreal, my only OSCE country, by the way, as a consul. The story bears telling. I was on a visa line interviewing applicants for non-immigrant visas when my boss dropped the morning read file into my inbox. Some of you may remember back in the days when the earth was still cooling, we had a paper file of cables to read each morning, and it was butterfly clipped together and given to you to read. Atop the file that morning was a cable asking for volunteers to go to a place called Kosovo. I didn't know what Kosovo was, but I figured it had to be better than a visa line, so I volunteered to go. <laughs> I joined a team of a dozen US military and foreign service officers, a dozen, tasked to reduce the violence and, in fact, stop the killing. We weren't very effective, because as I would learn and as, as I would see repeated in all the wars that I was a part of, if the parties to the conflict aren't yet tired of the killing, it probably can't be stopped. This was a classic insurgency fought by one ethnic group against another, primarily because of the inequitable distribution of resources and the purposeful degradation of rights by one group, of one group, by the leadership of another. Early on in my work there, we went to a village called Sinek. Yellow, their skin was yellow. They had dirt under their fingernails and their feet were dirty. There were six of them, all women, under the tarpaulin. Some of them had lived long enough to have their wounds bandaged before they died. Some of them were killed more or less instantly as shrapnel or 7.62 millimeter rounds had entered their bodies. They'd been dead for about 24 hours. 
We knew this because we'd come to witness their funeral, to witness and to stand a type of guard. If we were present, the Serb snipers wouldn't shoot the family members as they buried their dead. It was the first time I'd ever seen war dead. I remember being surprised that their skin was yellow. My experiences with death before that day had been limited to a few funerals, a friend's older brother, my grandmother. None of them had been yellow, so I was surprised at the color. It was the first time I had ever seen what dead people looked like if no embalming was done. What they looked like without makeup and a nice suit of clothes. They were just dead. Lying in a tangle of limbs under a blue UN tarp on a trailer that only a week before had probably carried peppers and corn to the market in Malashevo. Only parts of their bodies were visible. I couldn't see all of their faces. One had an arm resting across her forehead. One had a bandage covering most of her head. One of the dead was missing, an 18-month-old child. We'd seen some dogs on the way up the trail. Morgan Morris, the dauntless US ref UN refugee agency field officer who had led us to the scene, said what all of us were thinking. The dogs probably got the body. She was right, of course, but none of us wanted to be the one to say it. We'd just met the mother, resting in a house in a village a couple of kilometers away, she had a bullet in her upper arm. The bullet had passed through her baby and then through her breast before lodging in her arm. The father said the baby was killed instantly. The bullet tore the child in half, he said. He dragged the mother away to safety. A doctor from the Red Cross was treating her wounds in a small house in the village. There were men and women and a 72-year-old man in one stifling, airless room of the house. All of them had been wounded in the attack. They sat silently on the floor, their backs against the walls of the room, lost in their pain and their thoughts, waiting. We drove off that little draw and back down into the village. The villagers wanted to bury the dead in the plain side of the ridge line, where we could still see the Serbian snipers. The land, they said, had been taken from them in the 1940s, and they had reclaimed it in the 1970s. It belonged to these people, and they were going to be sure the Serbs understood that. The women, were by, the women they were burying were born in this valley and had spent their lives raising crops in its fields and giving birth to their children in the small houses that made up the hard scrabble town. Down the hill at the intersection marking Cynic proper, a crowd of women and a few men had gathered. Some boys were sitting by the edge of the road with a wooden box filled with cigarettes, crackers, and chiclets, entrepreneurs. They sat expressionless as a small crowd swarmed our vehicle. I pushed open the door and stood pinned against the truck by the crowd as my translator echoed staccato pleas for help. One woman pushed through the crowd and held her baby at arm's length in front of me. I was face to face with the child while the mother spoke deliberately but calmly. She wants you to take her son out of here so the Serbs won't kill him. Moses said. I looked at the woman and said to Mimi, make sure she knows we can't do this. Say this. We're observers. We can't relocate you or your son. If we do, the government in Belgrade will order all of us out of the country. I felt feckless and impotent as the words spilled out. For the first time, I understood the folly of being in the war only to observe a tourist among the victims. It was hot, and with the sun beating down on me, I felt cowardly, yellow, hiding behind my sunglasses. I waved my notebook at the Red Cross panel truck and said that was the vehicle that would take them to safety. I thought the Red Cross would probably refuse, but I was unable to muster the courage to tell the woman and the 50 other people crowded around me that there was no hope they would get out that day with an international. I found out later I was wrong. Several UNHCR officers arrived late in the day, and one of them took it upon herself to evacuate some of the children to a safer village. Before we left, I went back to the house where the wounded were being treated. I had to tell the mother of the missing child we didn't find her baby. It would have served no other purpose to tell her what we thought had happened. I couldn't have found those words anyway. That evening after we returned to our office, we washed our truck. I drafted my report. It was only about three pages long, no speculation, just the things we understood to have happened based on what we saw and what was reported to us. I said it appeared a Serbian infantry unit had swept through the valley from north to south, preceded by a barrage of mortar fire. During the barrage and subsequent infantry sweep, 
Seven women and one infant had been killed, and 11 others, including a 72-year-old man, wounded. Vehicles and clothes, food and other supplies were burned in the sweep. I said we'd seen no evidence of weapons or of any insurgent activity in the village or among the villagers. I didn't mention the funeral or the dogs. I didn't mention the woman begging me to take some action to save her child. I didn't mention the look on the old man's face. I carefully caveated what was told to us versus what we saw ourselves with qualifiers like reportedly and allegedly. I carefully made the report and the events in the village the center of the report rather than my own actions or feelings. Never star in your own report. I let my teammates read the report to ensure we all agreed with it, and then I turned it into the reports officer, our editor. In doing so, I had written a crisp, dry account of a messy, horrible act of cruelty. I had documented my first war crime. That was only one day in Kosovo. And had it been only one day, that would have likely been fine. But I had two years of days just like that, some a little better, many considerably worse. We didn't stop the fighting, the burning, the rapes. It took a NATO bombing campaign to bring the Serbs to the table. The best I can say is that some of my research, some of my reporting, wound up at The Hague at the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia as evidence in the trial of Slobodan Milosevic. I stayed in Kosovo for two years. I left there and went back to Rwanda and spent two years doing more or less what I'd been doing there previously, documenting war crimes, crimes against humanity, searching for those mass graves, reporting back to Washington what I learned. Not long before I was scheduled to leave, I was sitting on the couch in our front office, waiting for a meeting to begin when CNN shifted its coverage to a report that plane had flown into one of the Twin Towers. All of our lives changed that day. Six months later, I was recalled to active duty in the Army and sent to Afghanistan. I didn't know it before I went to Afghanistan, but five years of working in the midst of genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, and crimes against humanity had changed me. I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. It struck a few months into my tour in Afghanistan. In the cold pre-dawn, I can hear generators running and vehicles moving on the other side of the base. But it's quiet inside my tent. None of the soldiers I share the tent with is even snoring. I've been awake for a few hours, but I stay in my sleeping bag, fighting the nearly overwhelming urge to run away. The Taliban have launched a couple of rockets towards the base during the week, so we're all a little on edge, but that isn't what's keeping me up. I'm bundled into my sleeping bag, trying to control my racing heart and trembling because the dead have come to talk to me. They've been coming every night for a couple of weeks. The dead from Kosovo or Rwanda beckoning to me, pulling me from a warm, comforting sleep into a series of wretched, tormenting, wide-awake dreams. Tonight it's the dead from a farm near the town of Podievo. Burned Bible black, twisted into hideous, contorted shapes, they lie in a cold rain that falls through the burned-away roofs and pools on the dirty floor. Do you remember us, they ask, most assuredly. The night before, it was the dead from the village of Rajak, 45 of them shot in the back of the head and left to die in a rocky ditch on a frozen January morning in 1999. They dropped by for a chat. Why didn't you do more to save us, they asked. Why, indeed. Night after night, they appear on the big screen of my mind, an oversaturated technicolor writhing and imploring. Night after night, the murdered and the mutilated come back. Each time, I'm scared and ashamed. I know they aren't real. I know they are only images in my head, but I fear them no less for knowing this. They terrify me for what they remind me of, the fighting I didn't stop and the lives I didn't save. They terrify me for what they represent, that I can no longer stop them from taking control of my mind. I lie on my bed trembling, eyes wide open, and seeing the dead in front of me. The trouble begins slowly, developing over time, and by the time I'm fully aware of it, I'm having graphic, violent dreams nightly. I wake from these dreams in a panic, shaking, heart racing, crying sometimes, always afraid to go back to sleep. I'm losing control of my brain, of my mind. 
Soon I start seeing the images when I'm awake. During the day, I'm unable to concentrate. I sit at my desk or go to planning meetings for operations, shaking until I have to leave the tent to go outside and get control of myself. I fear I've lost my mind, but I'm afraid to ask for help. I fear I'll be ridiculed, considered weak and cowardly. You see, in army culture, especially in this elite unit filled with rangers and paratroopers, asking for help is a sign of weakness. My two Bronze Star Medals, my tours in Airborne and Special Operations units, none of this will matter. To ask for help will be seen as breaking. But when I can no longer control the images in my head, when in the middle of the day I am forced to hide, shaking and crying in a concrete bunker, railing against the noise and the images, when I realize that to continue to deny this would be to endanger the soldiers I was sent to Afghanistan to lead, I finally ask for help. And I got help, and I survived my full tour. I went home and returned to my job at the State Department, folded up my uniforms into a, 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 a bag under the bed. Four months later, I landed in Iraq. I served a tour there on a tiny base 30 miles from the Iranian border. While I was there, the Army called and ordered me back to active duty. They wanted to send me to Iraq, you see, but I was already there. <laughs> I fooled them. Tried to outsmart me, didn't they? Four months after I left Iraq, I landed in Sudan and was sent immediately to Darfur in the midst of what two American presidents and three American secretaries of state have called by its rightful name, genocide. There were 200,000 dead and about two million displaced. I was part of a peacekeeping mission tasked to stop the fighting in an area bigger than Iraq with a couple of hundred peacekeepers and about a thousand protection troops. I stayed about two years in that. During part of my tour, I was detailed over to the military planning service of the United Nations Peacekeeping Office. The only thing you need to know about this is that El Fasher is the capital of Darfur. I was in El Fasher in support of the United Nations mission to organize and run a training exercise for the African Union peacekeeping staff I had just left. I was the scenario writer. The three scenarios I'd written went roughly like this. A humanitarian emergency develops into a security crisis. Deal with it. A security crisis develops into a humanitarian catastrophe and includes significant press interest in bad weather. Deal with it. The kitchen sink of problems arrives sequentially. Deal with all of them. The Amos, the African Union staff, had an officer on the UN team who had helped us with the details of the scenarios. He had the plots and he knew the solutions. He also gave these to his colleagues on the staff. And they still failed. Personally, I was failing too. I was falling apart, in some ways worse than I had in Afghanistan. I was deep into a bad PTSD episode. I was drinking myself into a stupor every night in an Islamic Republic where alcohol was banned. And I was carrying on a clandestine affair with a UN official. The genocide was actually diminishing, but we had no way of knowing that at the time. What I saw around me was an expansion. 300,000 dead, two and a half million displaced. I had no real safety net to catch me, nor anything during the day to hold me together. I had very few actual responsibilities. Since the scenarios were already written, I was mostly along for the ride with the UN team. And despite this, I was managing pretty well until one day. The woman with whom I'd been having an affair for a couple of months asked me what would happen after our work together ended. We'd been at it for a few weeks, first in Nairobi, then in Addis, now in Darfur, having fun in nice hotels in Kenya and Ethiopia in dodgy guest houses in Sudan, drinking, playing. But when she started making noises about next steps, that set off alarm bells in my head, dragging me back to the realization that I had a life outside the little war zone bubble, and soon I would have to go back to that life and to a reckoning. I obviously wasn't rational. Nonetheless, I was functioning at a pretty high level, writing intricate scenarios for a modern-ish fighting force, operating in the midst of a com complex emergency. 
continuing to collect information about the status of rebel forces, the government of Sudan's response to the insurgency, and writing reports for the embassy about what I'd learned, at the same time carrying on an illicit affair. But in my head, I was convinced that my life was fucked up and that all I was doing was hurting people. I'd failed to stop the fighting in Darfur just as I'd done in Kosovo and in Zaire. My writing sucked. My mom had just died. My marriage was a failure. I was a failure. Everything I touched brought pain to others. I wasn't getting better. I was getting worse. And the dark stuff in my head triumphed over the rational, workaday reality. So I decided to kill myself. I think I did so quite rationally. I thought about it through the morning, scripting the steps and the timing, mentally locating the tools I would need and sorting out their acquisition, thinking about the aftermath, both immediate and longer term. By lunchtime, I had a plan. I'd acquired the tools. Late that afternoon, I began work. I grabbed a couple of beers out of the icebox, wrapped them in a t-shirt, and put them on the seat of the Toyota. Earlier in the afternoon, I'd gone over to the US team house and borrowed a pistol from the Special Forces team sergeant. He loaned it to me, no questions asked, because we'd worked together for six months or so, and he had no reason to suspect that I was anything other than a competent, professional career officer. I drove out of town to the west, somewhat dramatically, I realized, into the setting sun towards the reservoir. I pulled off the main road to the north side towards some villages, just clusters of huts, really, and stopped the truck on a low rise, just high enough to see the sun falling toward the desert. I opened one of the beers. I started crying, but I don't really know why. I was filled with a sense of failure and frustration, a sense of conclusion. Nothing I touched succeeded. Nothing I did was good. I'd been through five wars in 10 years and done nothing to stop the killing in Rwanda, in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Darfur. I felt as if I had reached a logical place in my life to end it. I opened a second beer and picked the pistol up off the seat. It felt good in my hand. I felt surprisingly deft with it. I pointed it out the windshield with the magazine resting on the steering wheel and curled my finger around the trigger. I imagined pulling the trigger and the immediate pull the weapon would make as the round fired. It wasn't anything to shoot at out there, so I would have just blown out the windshield. But even if there was something to shoot at, I was holding the pistol in my right hand and I'm left-handed, so I probably wouldn't have hit it. I put the pistol back on the seat. I remember a momentary flash of clarity. Who else would I hurt if I did this? My wife, certainly. Anyone else? My sister, maybe. I thought that what I was getting ready to do would leave a hole in some lives. I even thought about someone having to clean up the truck afterwards. Maybe I'd do it outside and leave less of a mess. But the clarity passed, and I was overwhelmed with a sense of futility and sadness. I'd failed to stop the war. So many people were dead because of my failures. Images rushed at me, the 45 dead from Rachak, the raped nun from Bunia, the man with the red-rimmed eyes and his mutilated family near Senek. I picked up the pistol and charged it, loading a bullet into the firing chamber. My hands were shaking. I put the beer down and took the pistol off of Sait. I was sobbing and talking to myself, to the spheres, to no one. The pistol was ready. I shifted it to my left hand. I looked at it in my hand, lying partly on my lap and pointed down a bit. I took a deep breath to calm myself. I was ready. Then the phone rang. It scared the hell out of me. And I jumped, startled. I almost pulled the trigger, which would have been highly ironic to shoot myself in the foot while preparing to shoot myself in the head. I looked at the phone lying on the seat of the pickup and saw that it was my wife calling from Washington, D.C. What was this? Serendipity, karma, luck, or just uncanny timing? With my thumb, I put the pistol back on safe and laid it on the seat. I talked to Maureen for a few minutes. I stared out through the windshield and watched the sun setting over the rocky brown desert of Darfur. The ringing phone had broken the spell. After all the crying and shaking, the moralizing and justifying, the calming of hands and nerves, the intense focus on the immediate act of charging the weapon and taking off the safety and preparing to put the barrel in my mouth, the ringing phone pulled me back from the brink. I came home. Well, first I gave the pistol back to my team sergeant. You gotta account for your weapons. 
I got some treatment and I thought everything was going to be okay. But about a year later, I lost my security clearance. I re retired from government service. I'd spent a career writing, documenting these wars. Almost every day of the previous 10 years, I'd been collecting information and writing home about it. I wrote those crisp, dry accounts of messy, horrible acts of cruelty and sent them off to Washington. Often, I would then go back to my tent or to my room and write the rest. I wrote the remainders, the things that didn't make it into the official report. And most of that writing is what became this book. After I left government service, I kept writing. I was trying to make sense of what I'd seen and done for the previous 10 years. I went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins to study. One night I was driving home from class and I began to wonder what I would do with this education. You see, I was using my GI Bill benefits, thank you very much, and I felt the need to do something worthy. I had a fancy graduate degree from a great school. I was writing for Time Magazine, Foreign Policy, The American Interest, and others. And the idea came to me to give away what I'd learned. In a few days, I had the concept. I founded the Veterans Writing Project. We're a 501c3, and we provide no-cost writing workshops and seminars for veterans and for their family members. We teach creative writing and expressive or therapeutic writing. We've taught our creative writing program in 10 states with partners like the Wounded Warrior Project, Pat Tillman Foundation, even the Wilderness Society. We've been teaching this expressive writing program at Walter Reed for nearly three years now as part of a National Endowment for the Arts program. And we've just begun teaching at the Washington, D.C. VA Medical Center. So I promised you I was going to ask you to do something. Actually, it's two things. First, right now, stop thinking of mental health care as something scary just health care. We need to break the stigma of asking for treatment for PTSD. From corporal to general, every leader has to stop this right now. The vast majority of us who are struggling with PTSD are going to be just fine. Care is improving and every year the doctors get smarter. In point of fact, the people we can't help are the ones who don't ask for help. So we should all just get over this sense that someone with PTSD is broken. They, we, I, need your help. We need medical care just the same as if we'd broken an ankle on a jump. There should be no difference in how the two are perceived. Second, help me. Help me in the Veterans Writing Project transfer the skills and confidence to more veterans, to more service members, and to their family members to tell their stories. We do this at no cost to the participants, but we need sponsorship to make it happen. It's important that we capture these stories before they disappear into the ether. So few people actually write anything more than emails today. We need to encourage service members, veterans, and their families to write their stories down and preserve them. General Sullivan and I have been discussing ways to work together to do this, and I hope we can move forward. And I hope you'll all join us. And with that, thank you very much.